from that grave, my God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Because we were the bakers. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. And now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted. Welcome this morning to Silver Creek Fellowship, those here in person and watching online. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us this morning. I do want to remind those of you here of one thing before we move on, is that we do have prayer available in the back of the auditorium there. If you see that black banner that says prayer, you can head back there at any point during worship, um, and somebody will be ready there to pray with you. Um, and I just really encourage you to do that. We are going to keep singing a few more songs.
Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Yes, Lord, we welcome your presence this morning. Come speak to us.
thank you, Lord, for your great sacrifice you made for us, that we can have hope every day, hope for the future, hope for tomorrow, God. We praise your name. Thank you for your faithfulness. In your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see you. And I just want to tell you, you're going to be really glad that you came today. So we've got a great um, special guest speaker with us today. Kurt Bubna is here with his wife, Laura. Kurt is from East Point um, Church, where he planted it up in um, Spokane Valley in uh, Washington. You know, it's kind of to the right and up. And um, <clears throat> they've got a great church there. He's part of the Purpose Driven Network. Um, they minister in Africa like we do in Gabon. They're part of the international partnering churches where they work in Botswana. And um, it feels like with, even though we are just really kind of renewing friendships with them, it feels like we are family already. And uh, I want you to just enjoy what, what Kurt's got to bring us. Uh, I think he's got a message of hope for us. And how many of you know you could just never have too much hope? You know, we just need it. Would you agree? Yeah, well, let's welcome Kurt. Thank you, Rob. Good morning, everybody. I had so much fun last night. I tell you, I, you know, sometimes we take for granted the things that we have, and I just want to tell you, never take this church or your worship for granted. It was awesome last night. Awesome this morning. If I give it for the worship team one more time, it was so good. You know, I get around, and uh, I have the opportunity to go to lots of different churches, and when I step into a place like this where God is uh, present and worship is passionate, it just blesses me and makes my job easy. So thanks again for being here today. Rob and Kathy, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about hope, and as Rob said, it's probably a fairly common topic. I'm going to look at a passage. We'll start and end with Romans 15 today. There'll be other, a few other verses that I'll land on as we walk through this. Um, but hope's kind of a big deal to me. It's, it's one of my passionate topics, one of the things I love to talk about the most. My last book, I had the honor of writing it for you, my last one was called Uncommon Hope, and I wrote an entire book about this topic. So we're going to take about the next two or three hours, and <laughs> no, actually, I'll be pretty short. Uh, when my kids were young, we have four children, now I have four kids all grown up and ten grandchildren, but when they were young, we loved having critters and animals around the house, and we had a lot of different things. We, were not, we did not live on a farm but I felt like it at times. We had lots and lots of different kinds of animals. My oldest son, Nathan, though, he, uh, somewhere along the line, uh, grew uh, infatuated with rats and uh, pet rat rodents. Now, apparently, they're very smart, and they're actually pretty clean. They're not like the rats that you have in the gutters. But I hate rats. I'm just going to come out and say it. I, I really do not like them. I don't like rats at all. Um, maybe that's why this story caught my attention. Let me just read it to you. Several years ago, an experiment on endurance was conducted at the University of California at Berkeley. You know, those crazy Californians. Involving Norwegian field rats. Now, I'm going to tell you, do not try this at home. And so if there are children here, mommy, let's know, don't do this. But the rats were placed in a, in a tub of water and forced to swim until they grew exhausted and finally drowned. Now, I'm pretty sure you can't get away with that anymore, but that's what they did. During the first experiment, the researchers discovered that on average, Norwegian field rats were capable of swimming for over seven hours before drowning. That's pretty incredible. A second experiment was conducted exactly like the first one, but with one exception. When a rat was getting too exhausted to swim any longer, the research, researchers would remove the rat from the water for just a few seconds and then put the rat back to the water to continue swimming. Amazingly, these rats were able to swim for almost 24 hours before they died. They concluded these sadistic Berkeley, Southern California researchers, that rats in the second group were able to swim much longer because, wait for it, because they had hope. They had hope. The rats had experienced a rescue, and what kept them going was the hope that they would be rescued again. It's my conviction that we hu humans need hope as well. I, I have seen a, a lot of despair over the last couple of years during the season we've gone through. Uh, in our church, we've had, had lots of people due to COVID. Had a 14-year-old kid uh, commit suicide during this time. And I could tell you a lot of really tragic stories. And one thing I'm absolutely convinced of more than ever, and this is the good news, is that we as Christ followers have the hope. We, we follow the hope of the world. And we have hope that we can offer to anyone and everyone around us. And so uh, I want to encourage you to have hope. 
before you drown and to hold on to it no matter what. And here's the big idea today. Hope is not based on what you feel, uh, know or feel or think or accomplish. It's not based on something that you can figure out. Hope is found in who you know. For hope isn't a feeling, it's a person. It's not a feeling, it's a person. I think there's a lot of confusion about hope. I hope to clear some of that up today. But the fact is that because of God's presence, because of his power, because of his faithfulness, you and I can live in hope every day of our lives, no matter what we face, no matter what happens. The Apostle Paul knew this, and it was his heartfelt prayer that we would know the hope that we can have in Christ. And so he prayed that we would overflow with hope, meaning that we would, it would bubble out. I love that word, overflow. It would just like spill out all over from us onto everyone around us. And so he wrote this in Romans 15, 13. Look at it with me. Paul said, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So much in just one verse that we really could take all day and talk about it. But I'm just going to land on a few things. But again, let me read it. Listen carefully. Paul says, May the God of hope, this is prayer, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is the God of hope. Paul says, and we can overflow with that kind of hope. So why does hope matter? Uh, you may think, well, obviously because it's good, it's better than not having hope. Well, let me give you some things to consider. Hope matters, number one, because God gives us hope regardless of our past mistakes. God gives you and me hope, gives anyone, everyone, the opportunity to embrace and to hold on to hope regardless of our past mistakes. Here's something we all share in common. We all have failed. We all have failed God, we failed ourselves, and we failed others. Every one of us share that in common. And I'm not being pessimistic. I'm not being negative. It's just a reality that we've all failed. On top of that, the accumulation of guilt that we carry as a result of those failures is often an extremely heavy burden for us to carry. But you and I are never hopeless, not when God is in the mix. Not when God is in the mix. Now, we can deny our, our, our sin, our guilt. We can say, what, what guilt? I don't believe in guilt. I don't have guilt. I don't know what you're talking about. We can deflect it. It's not my fault. It's someone else's fault. It's not my, I'm not to blame. We can dilute it with all sorts of things, you know, from the drugs and alcohol to too much TV, too, watching too much Netflix or playing too many hours of video games. We can dilute our guilt and our shame. And the tragedy, though, all along is God says, let me take that from you. Just give me that past experience, that, those painful things that you've gone through, and let me take that from you. You don't have to live with that anymore. You see, with forgiveness, there is great hope. And God says, I can forgive you of anything and everything. And so we don't have to live under the cloud of past failures, no matter what we've done. And that's really good news. I said earlier that what we have to offer the world is good news. Unlike, and I hope you think this through and that you're thinking right now about a, a coworker, a family member, a friend, somebody you know in your life that maybe is experiencing some hopelessness. And here's the good news. You can tell them, hey, there's hope in Jesus. You can find hope. And no matter what you've done, no matter what you've experienced, you can know hope. The psalmist wrote this in Psalms 130, verse 1 to 7. I love this. He says, out of the depths I cry to you. So he's in the pits. He's in a bad place. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, verse 3, if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Verse 4, I love this. But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared be to, to be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. Uh, more than a watchman wait for the morning. More than a watchman wait for the morning. Oh, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Look at that last pretty, uh, verse again. Put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. He's never going to give up on you. never going to let you down. And with him is full redemption. Aren't you glad with God it's a full meal deal? That it's everything. That's full redemption. Once forgiven, we can forget the past. We don't have to live under that cloud anymore. It's forgotten by God. Hebrews 8.12 says this, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And Old and New Testament, we see that this is the nature of God. His mercies are new what? Every morning. We don't have to live under the guilt and shame of our past. And it doesn't matter what you've done or what you used to be. In spite of your past, God gives you the, the opportunity to start all over. Here's why. Because he's more concerned with who you are becoming than what you've been. Let me say that again. God is always more concerned with who you are becoming in him rather than what you've been. And there's so many illustrations from the scriptures about this. Moses committed murder, yet God used him to deliver the nation of Israel. 
David committed murder and adultery, yet God used him. Peter was a wimpy defector, betrayed Jesus, yet God used him. The apostle Paul persecuted the church, and yet God used him. And I could go on and on and on. There's I mean, just so many stories in the Old and New Testament where God says, you know what, I don't, whatever you've done, that's what you've done. That's not, the, that's not the end of your story. See, we humans, we like to put a period where God puts a comma. We like to say, well, you know what, I, I did this, I failed this, I am that. End of story. And it's not the end of the story. I've got a friend that uh, I actually met for the first time at a marriage conference. Laura and I were speaking out in Cannon Beach, Oregon, beautiful place. And we were doing a marriage r- uh, retreat there speaking. And a guy came up to me after. His name was Sean. And uh, he's, uh, he's, I could tell he was struggling. And I'm not sure why. You're at a marriage conference. Could be for lots of different reasons. And I said, hey, well, tell me your story. What's God doing in your life? And I love to ask that question. Tell me your story. What's God doing? It's like one of my favorite things to tell, say to people. Tell me your story. What's Jesus doing in your life? He said, oh, you don't really want to hear my story. I said, no, actually, I do. He said, well, and he proceeded to go on and, and really tell me how he grew up in a broken, dysfunctional home, was messed up from an early age, I didn't graduate high school, got involved with drugs in the wrong crowd, ended up, and then he, he got real quiet and couldn't make eye contact, looked down at the ground and said, I ended up in prison. And I, in fact, I, I'm an ex-con. I did 10 years for my crime. And I'm saying, okay, but you're here. So tell me more. He said, well, in prison, I gave my life to Christ. I gave my life to Jesus. I said, that's awesome, Sean. That is so cool. He says, no, you know, I, and, and basically, and I'll, I'll cut to the chase and paraphrase the rest of the story. He essentially said to me, Kurt, I, I know that God's forgiven me, but I don't, there's no hope for my future. There's no, I, because of what I've done, because, because I've got a record, there's no hope for me. And I looked him in the eye, and his eyes are just moistening up, and he's starting to tear up. And I said, Sean, look at me. And he looked at me, and I said, dude, we all have a record. We all have a record. Romans 3, 23 says, for what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it doesn't end there. In fact, here's your homework assignment. Read Romans 3, 23, 24, and 25. Because verse 24 and 25 basically go on. I'll paraphrase. It says, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, comma, but because of God's grace, because of his redemption, because of his forgiveness, we can walk in freedom. That's what Paul says there. That he says, yeah, we've all sinned. We've all failed. We've all blown it. We all have that in common. We all, I said, Sean, we all have a record. Every one of us has a record. But that's not the end of your story, Sean. That's not the end of my story. It's not the end of yours. I could give you other passages for the sake of time. I won't. Titus 3 would be another one you might want to take a look at where Paul says, once upon a time. That's, again, the Bubna paraphrase version. Once upon a time. We were messed up, far from God. We failed. We were miserable. We were depraved and, and sinning and hating. It was horrible. And then the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God came and redeemed our lives. You see, God's specialty is redemption, restoration, and renewal. So no matter what you've done, no matter what you've and here's what I, why I say this. Because all the time, I see it all the time, even from people who've been walking with Jesus for a long time, they disqualify themselves from service to God. Well, I could never be a fill-in-the-blank. I could never do fill-in-the-blank. I'm not qualified. There's no way God could fill-in-the-blank. Why? We, we DQ, we disqualify ourselves because we don't believe that we can be used by God because of our past. But here's something I want you to know. God delights. Listen, God delights in taking the broken and the lost and the guilt-ridden and setting them free by his grace and his forgiveness. God delights in making you and me trophies of his grace and his goodness. God is our hope regardless of our past failures. And so if you've got a friend or you know somebody, or if it's you, and you've been struggling with all the yeah buts and all the excuses and trying to disqualify yourself, and you think there's a period at the end of your story, I'm telling you, no, no matter what you've done, it's a comma, and your story's not finished yet. Here's the second reason why hope matters. Number two. God gives us hope regardless of our present inadequacies. Now, most of us Christ followers, Christians, we get the fact that we're forgiven, and yeah, that we're new creatures in Christ. We know 2 Corinthians 5, that God made me a new creature in Christ. That's awesome. Most of you know that, but we, a lot of us still struggle here. See, God gives us hope regardless of our present inadequacies. I love to listen to great preachers, great motivational preachers, and I'm going to date myself but because uh, I think both these guys are, are dead, but Zig Ziglar, I think he died quite a few years ago. But, but uh, Zig was one of those inspirational preachers. Uh, Stephen uh, Co- uh, Coven, another one. But a mo- guy that's still alive, barely, is John Maxwell. And uh, I say that in 
kidding because he's getting pretty old. But you guys heard him recently. And John's a motivational speaker. And I love it when these guys stand up and they inspire me and they tell you to do all sorts of things and they give me great hope for my future. But here's the deal, and here's something that's important for you to understand. In the Scriptures, in the Word of God, hope is not based on what I can accomplish or what I do. I, again, I've already said motivational speakers can inspire you, and there's some great things you can learn from them. True. But unfortunately, all too often, they kind of put the focus on whom? You! It's like, well, yeah, and, and you walk into any bookstore. Again, as an author, I, I walk into bookstores, and there's, there's just thousands of self-help books. It's just tons of the row that this goes forever, it seems like, of all these self-help books. And again, some good truths are there. There's things you can put into practice there. There's certainly some things that are helpful there. But here's, the, here's something you need to understand. In the Scriptures, hope has nothing to do with self-confidence. It has everything to do with God confidence. Let me say that again. It has nothing to do with self-confidence. As divi- defined in the Scriptures, it's not some vague, mamby-pamby, wishful thinking. It's not, well, I hope so, or, well, if I can really just suck it up and just suck it up, buttercup, I'll do okay. No. In the Scriptures, the word hope implies a sense of confident expectation. Wait for it. In God. Why can we have hope regardless of our present inadequacies? Because we have relationship with Jesus. He's the object of our hope. The reason of our, our confidence is in him, not in us. And you've got to understand, hope is birthed and grown and sustained. It's birthed and grown and sustained in an environment where we clearly understand this important truth. It's not about our strength or our abilities, but God's. Now, that doesn't mean we just roll over and say, well, whatever. And that, yeah, Of course, it's a cooperative work. We, we cooperate with God. But when it comes right down to it, whatever you're facing now, What's going to get you through that and what's going to bring you to the other end with joy and peace and and faith and confidence is not you but God, a God confidence. You see, you and I could never swim long enough. We just can't. And if you think you can, you let me know how that works out, you know, three, four months or years from now. Because the truth of the matter is I've I've talked to way too many people who just thought, well, I'll just, I'll give, I'll try one more. I'll just give a little harder. I'll just work a little bit better. I'll, I'll do more. I'll do more. I, 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 I. And I tell them, find that in the scriptures. It's always we cooperate with God as, as we partner with God. But it's God's power. It's God's strength. It's God, the Holy Spirit who lives within you that empowers you to do what God's called you to do. Isn't it awesome that everything God has asked you to do, he empowers you to do? I mean, I think that's really good news, that everything he asks you to do. Have you read the book? Have you read the New Testament? And people say it's all about grace. Yes, it is. And there are a lot of things in grace we're called to do, things we're called to walk out, to be transformed into the image of Jesus, into the image of God, God's Son. And the way that happens is not by us working harder, but by us cooperating more with the Holy Spirit who lives within us, and he, therefore, is our hope. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 33. I love the psalms especially when I'm struggling because they're so real. But Psalm 33, 17 to 22 says this. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance, despite all its great strength it cannot save. Now, I, I'll put that in modern terms. A tank is awesome, but a tank's still not going to win the battle. It's still a vain hope. Verse 18, but, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope, there it is, whose hope is in his unfailing love. God's eyes are on those who revere, trust, put their hope in him, whose hope in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. Verse 20, we wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Verse 22, may your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. If my math is right, four times hope is referred to in six verses here. That's why I love this passage. And the key is the Lord. We fix our eyes on the Lord. We put our hope. We wait for the Lord. I remember the first time I gave a sermon to a bunch of my peers. I was speaking about in front of about 200 pastors. Now, talking is, you know, for a living is fine. But when you got to do so in front of the people that are your peers and some of them you respect and have great admiration for, I, I would say I, I was scared spitless. I was pretty nervous and pretty upset and pretty frustrated. And I was like, Lord, why did I do this? Why did I say yes to this? And and I'm sitting there during worship, and, and I'll be, be honest with you. I was, my eyes were all focused on me. 
And like, what am I doing? What am I going to do? And how am I going to do this? And oh God, oh God, oh God. You know, that prayer, oh God, oh God, oh God. And I'm just, I'm, I'm stressing out. In the midst of that, I kid you not, just one of those times where God just interrupts my stupidity. And thankfully, he does that on a fairly regular basis. And he says, like, Kurt. Yes, Lord. That wasn't an audible voice, but I knew it was the Holy Spirit. Kurt, stop looking at you. Start focusing on me. Now, how many of you think that's like, you've never heard that before? No. I mean, I know that. I know it here. The problem is sometimes I, I can't get it here. And then I don't get it into where I live. We all know the right thing to do. We all know that we're supposed to put our hope in Jesus. Jesus is always the right answer. If you've been to Sunday school, what's the right answer? It's Jesus. It's always Jesus. Of course it is. But we've got to stop in those moments and and remember, despite whatever we're facing, we don't look at you, look to him. I realized in that moment that something I've tried to remember is that I'm often weak and inadequate and unable to do so. And nothing of eternal value ever happens just because of me anyhow. It's all because of Jesus, because of him. Have you found yourself in a place, maybe even recently, where you just felt overwhelmed? You're facing a task at home, at work. You're facing a relationship with your spouse or your kid or your parent, and you just feel like, I just don't have enough. I just can't do this. I, I, I. And I'm telling you, some of you know exactly. I see a few heads nodding because you know that when you're there in that place, how many of you feel hope in that moment? You don't. When it's I, 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 I get really depressed and really frustrated and really discouraged. But when I turn my eyes to the Lord, when I put my hope in him, that's where I find what I need. It's in those moments the question is, whom will I trust in? Whom will I put my confidence in? Whose strength will I rest in? And who's going to be my source of strength? And despite your present inadequacies or my, despite whatever you're facing, because of them, God is your hope. Let me reread again verse 20 to 21 from Psalm 33. We wait for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. It's all about God. And no matter what your present inadequacies are, again, don't disqualify yourself. Just put your hope in the Lord. One more. Number three, and finally, hope matters because God gives us hope regardless of our future uncertainties. Regardless of our future uncertainties. I want you to think about this last couple of years, and Rob and I were talking about this yesterday. If you had said to me two years ago that we would face a worldwide pandemic that would change the course of history, literally, change the course of church that would have influenced life, not just a little bit here, not just in Silverton, not just in Oregon, not just in the United States, but around the world. I mean, he mentioned Botswana. I, I haven't been there two years. And I miss my friends. I've, I'm, I've got Zoomophobia now. You know what that is? It's like, I'm so tired of Zoom. It's like, please, I want real humans. And, but that's all we've been able to do. And if you had told me two years ago that this would be an, our norm, what we would go through for a couple of years or, or longer, I'd have just said, no, way. In fact, we were comparing stories, and, and I really felt, here's what I thought. When it hit, and our governor uh, in, in Washington said, hey, we're going to take a couple weeks to flatten the curve. Here's what I thought. Okay, we'll take a couple weeks to flatten the curve. And here's what I expected. I really thought maybe three, four weeks into this thing, we'd be back to, quote, unquote, normal, and that people would rush back to church. That it would be like, how many of you were around for 9-11 after 9-11, some of you older folks? And do you remember the Sundays after that? I mean, you couldn't find an empty seat in church. The church I was a part of, we were like packed and people, standing room only for like two or three weeks until people forgot. But it's still, it, I thought that's what's going to happen. We're going to go through three weeks, four weeks at the top, and boom, we're going to open. I, I told the staff, I said, guys, we need to start planning now for what's going to happen when they start coming back by the thousands to church. Uh, that didn't happen. It still hasn't happened. We don't know. We, again, I mentioned last night, we don't know our next breath. We don't understand. We don't know what's coming in a minute from now, let alone next week, next year, or whenever. And that can be pretty discouraging unless you hold on to this reality. Let me say it again. God gives us hope regardless of our future uncertainties. Anybody here a control freak? I'll raise both hands. 
I love to plan and structure and organize and get everything lined up. And there's nothing wrong with planning and organizing and structuring. And, but I, I do that a, a lot because I, I want to control. I'm a little fearful. I want to make sure it's all right, that it all comes together. But the truth is, is, is anything can happen and anything usually does. In fact, everything tends, tends to happen. And the things that I never expected, just boom, suddenly they're there. And if I let that sit and rattle around in my control freak brain too long, I start leaking hope l like you cannot imagine. I'm a, it's gone. I don't have hope. I what? I don't know what's going to come. How could I have hope if I put my hope in my ability to control? There's a story, and uh, it's, a, it's something I read recently in ancient China. <coughs> most of you know the Great Wall. I've not been there. I've seen it in National Geographic. And I, I've, you know, I've seen the pictures. Did you know that they built that thing to hold off the barbaric invading hordes? That was their plan. And so they built this Great Wall of China in, in places that's 25 feet high, 20 feet thick, and it's a total length of 2,000 miles. I think if you put all the sections together, it's actually like double that. So you got a 2,000-mile Great Wall, 25 feet thick, 20 feet high, millions of people to, took to build this thing, and a whole lot of people died in the, in, in the building of it. And here was their thinking. By its sheer size, it would protect them. Do you think they had any clue that the day would come where they'd be F-16s that could just fly over this thing or that there would be bombs that could take out a 25-foot wall? Of course they didn't. You see, they were thinking it was so long. You know why they built it so long? Because an invading army would never take the time, the years, to go around this thing to come and try to invade our country. They didn't understand. They didn't have a view. They didn't know their future. And here's a reality, and I don't, some of you are like, oh, please shut up. We don't either. Hello? We don't either. For us, the future is a lot like looking at a colorful painting that's about an inch away from our face. We just don't know. All we see is a blur. I'm, I'm going to take you through a little exercise. Now, if you don't do this, you're going to feel silly. All of us are going to do this together. But I want you just to just bear with me, and I want you to take your hand and put it right in front of your face. Everybody, come on. I'm watching you. Take your hand. Just put it around your face. Now, I want you to stare at your hand. Look at those lines or whatever. You're thinking, now I should have washed my hands better. But look, stare at your hand right now. If, if you're doing that right, everything behind your hand is blurry. I'm just a blur. All right, you can take it down. You guys look really silly. <clears throat> What's my point? When we're staring at that thing that's right in our face, everything else is a blur. Everything else around us is just like, oh, I don't know. And if you're staring at that thing, that, that uncertain thing, that future you don't know, that question you have about your health or about your job or about your finances or will there be enough money in retirement or what happens if the stock market goes belly up and you know I'm getting close to retirement age now and I'm thinking, boy, you know, I, I, I start paying attention to my mutual funds like I never did because I like in one day, and one day I could go, you know, and you just, I don't, again, I don't have any control over that. And if I'm focused on that right here, then I'm going to freak out and lose all my hope. Here's the good news. God has a vastly different perspective than we do. And he's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And he sees everything. He sees it all. And that's why the psalmist says, put your hope in the Lord. Don't put your hope in what you can see or what you can figure out. Don't put your hope in what you can control because that's a hopeless way to live. It might work for a while, but sooner or later that rug's going to, that proverbial rug's just going to get pulled right out from under you and it's going to be a miserable way to live. So what does it mean that God's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega? It means that though we have no control over our future events and we are basically clueless more often than we want to admit, we can trust God. We can put our hope in him because nothing ever catches him by surprise. Isn't that awesome? You know, there's not been one day in your entire life where God says, oh, I, I, did, I did not, did you see, Gabriel, did you see that coming? I had, I had no, I, no, there's not been one day in your life where God was shocked, surprised, blown away. He saw it all. He knew what was coming. And that messes with our gray matter, but the fact is, God knows everything, never catches him by surprise. What's our hope for tomorrow? That God knows what's coming, that he has promised to be with us no matter what. I love that song we sang earlier. 
that God has promised, we can trust in his promises, that he's faithful and true. Does that mean, let me insert, does that mean your life's always going to be easy? <laughs> Go like this. Nope. Does that mean that you're going to just have this, you know, blessing of the Lord on your life all the I think you will have the blessing of the Lord on your life all the days of your life. But you know what I think blessings look like a lot? Trouble. Weird. You know, that's not the American Western culture way of looking at blessing, is it? But I believe that sometimes the struggles we go through are the greatest blessings we'll ever experience. How many of you have gone through something and you hate it at the time, but a year later, ten years later, you look back and you go, wow. How many? Yeah. Wow. I, I, didn't, I didn't know, but now I know what Jesus was doing in me through that time. We can face our tomorrows with confident expectation, with a God confidence, with a God confidence because of him. Not too long ago, one more story and I'll wrap this up. <clears throat> uh, the church I pastor, uh, we started 19 years ago this January. We actually started a little bit before that with small groups. But we launched our first service in January of 2003. And in those last 19 years, we've planted uh, three different churches. And the last one we planted was uh, just a few months before COVID hit. Now, here's a little transparent, raw, real insight into Kurt Bubna. If I had known <laughs> that COVID was coming, there ain't no way in God's green earth I would have planted a church. Because it costs us. If you plant churches, it costs you time, energy, money. In fact, that last one, some of our very best people, you know, our, our best worship leader, uh, uh, something, I will, I'll just, again, being transparent, uh, two of our top five givers in the church went with a church plant. Yeah, pastors pay attention to stuff like that. And it's like, wow. And I, I remember thinking, okay, God, this is awesome. And, you know, we've done this, and it's great. It's a new church. It's exciting. I'm going to celebrate this. But there was, it's, have, have you given, I haven't, but have you given birth? I haven't, really. But it's, it's something, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, ah, oh, this was, uh, ah. It's so painful and so awesome. The ladies are going, how does he know? I've watched it four times. <clears throat> it's, it's painful but awesome. And that's exactly what planning a church is like. Starting a church, it was painful but awesome. But I'm here to tell you, I had no clue that within months, just a few months after that, that in March we would go through this traumatic change that impacted us in more ways than I ever dreamt possible. And I'll just be honest, if I had known what was coming, I probably would have said, nah, we're going to wait until this is over to plant a church. Now, fortunately, I didn't know. I, I say that not tongue-in-cheek. Fortunately, I, just, I have learned, God, I don't know what's coming, but I trust the one who does. And it's always worth it to trust Jesus. I could tell you so many more stories. It's always, always worth it to put your confidence and your hope in him. Regardless of what the future brings, and I don't know what's coming, here's what I know. God is your hope. And the one that you can trust to care for you no matter what. No matter what you've done, no matter where you're at, no matter what's coming. Are you listening? No matter what you've done, no matter where you're at, no matter what's coming, you can put your hope in him. Let me read it to you one more time and I'll pray. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not yours. Would you bow your heads? Let me pray for us. Jesus, I know that a lot of us have been around for a long time. We've walked with you maybe for decades. And this is not the first time that we've heard about hope or the first time that we've thought about hope. But I am convinced of this, Jesus, that in this season, more than ever, we need to be not only hopeful people who have hope in our own hearts, but we need to be hope bearers. We need to be people who are bringing hope to, to a world that's desperate for it, to a world around us that still is bound by fear, fear of the, of the present, fear of the future, a world that's living so many with, under the, guilt, the cloud of guilt and shame, and they just don't know what to do. And Jesus, you put us, you left us here to be light bearers, to be hope bearers, to be proclaimers of the good news that we can find hope in you. 
And so, Lord, for someone that maybe is watching online or sitting here right now and they have been hopeless, maybe they've even been considering taking their own life or, or just giving up on you or walking away from it all. It's just they don't, they don't have, they've lost their hope. God, would you this morning, Holy Spirit, would you restore that hope? Would you restore the hope that they have lost? Would you turn their eyes from themselves or from their circumstance or from their situation or from that blurry thing that they've seen and turn their eyes to you, Lord, right now? Give them hope, Holy Spirit, I pray, in the way that only you can. But for all of us, Lord, let us leave here today looking for the opportunity to bring hope to a world around us, to our sphere of influence that desperately needs it. Help us be that, to do that because of you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. A guest speaker who's done five minutes early. I mean, this guy's good. Thanks, Kurt. So uh, we're going to release you guys a couple things I'd love to point out to you. Um, one is a week uh, next Saturday. I was going to say a week from today, but today's Sunday. So next Saturday is going to be our very first work day on our Christmas lights extravaganza. If you would like to come and help us with Christmas lights, there's information there in your bulletin about how you can sign up and come and help us. But we would really appreciate uh, if you're able and willing to come and help us. This year is going to be bigger and better than last year as we do a drive-through experience and also a walking uh, experience for families here in our community. So uh, take some time, check that out, and come and help us out. One other thing, uh, Kurt told us when he first came up that he had the 10-hour the version of this message. He He's actually telling you the truth truth. In the lobby, we actually have his book, Uncommon Hope, available. If you'd like to purchase that, you can do that from our resource center there. So if you want the 10-hour version instead of the 30-minute version, uh, it is available for you out in the lobby. Okay, church, let's go. Let's go and do the stuff. Let's not just be hearers, but doers of the word. So go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you.